Welcome. Today we're looking into a really high pressure situation in emergency medicine. We're exploring treatment choices for pulseless ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation cardiac arrest. You know, when the heart's rhythm is dangerously wrong and every single second counts. Exactly. We're talking about patients in cardiac arrest, uh, specifically with those rhythms VT or VF, where they have no pulse, especially after maybe three defibrillation attempts haven't managed to reset the heart. Right. That's when the antiarrhythmic drugs come into play. That's the moment. So our goal here is to really unpack the evidence comparing two key drugs, yeah. lidocaine and amiodarone. Which one should be the go-to first-line agent? Let's see what the data says. Okay, first things first, let's just clearly define the patient group we're discussing and the main drugs involved. All right. So the focus is squarely on patients who are in cardiac arrest due to pulseless ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. Their heart's electrical activity is chaotic. It's not pumping blood effectively or maybe not at all. No pulse. And the drugs. The two big players we're comparing are lidocaine and amidarone. Uh, it's also worth noting that many studies compare these against a placebo, you know, a dummy treatment to get a baseline. Makes sense. <laughs> now, in such a critical situation, what are we actually hoping to achieve? What are the most important outcomes for these patients? Ultimately, the most important uh, primary outcomes are survival to hospital discharge and, critically, having a good neurological outcome. Surviving isn't enough. We want patients to survive with their brain function intact. Okay, survival with good function, that's the main goal. Are there other things researchers look at too? Absolutely. There are key secondary outcomes. One is return of spontaneous circulation, often called ROSC. That means getting the heart beating on its own again, ideally before they even arrive at the emergency department. Right, getting a pulse back. Exactly. We also track things like survival at 24 hours, overall survival to discharge, even if neurological outcome isn't perfect, and a favorable neurologic outcome, specifically at the point of hospital discharge. All right, we know who we're talking about, what drugs are in play, and what success looks like. So let's get into the research. There was a large randomized trial, wasn't there? Over 3,000 patients. What did that show about survival? Yes, that key trial involved uh, just over 3,000 patients. And the main finding, the primary outcome result, was actually pretty surprising for many. Oh, how so? It found no statistically significant difference in survival to hospital discharge, whether patients received amiodarone, lidocaine, or even placebo. Wow. No difference at all on the main survival outcome. That seems yeah. counterintuitive. So does that mean it doesn't matter which one you use? Or is there more to it? Any other findings? There's definitely more to it. While survival to discharge looked similar, the secondary outcomes told a different story. Lidocaine did significantly increase the rate of return of spontaneous circulation, the ROSC we mentioned by the time patients got to the emergency department, compared to placebo. Oh, significant. Uh, the p-value was 0 0.01, so statistically quite strong. Amiodarone, however, didn't show that same effect compared to placebo. Its p-value was 0.52, so not significant. Okay, so lidocaine seemed better at getting the heart started again quickly in that trial. That's what the secondary outcome suggests. And there was another interesting detail from a sub-analysis for patients whose initial rhythm wasn't shockable, but then became shockable during resuscitation. Right. Well, lidocaine led to a higher ROSC rate, about 40.5%, compared to 31.9% with amiodarone. And that difference was also statistically significant, P less than 0 0.05. Interesting nuances there. Now, that's one big randomized trial. Yeah. What about looking at broader real-world data? Did observational studies find anything different, perhaps in larger patient groups? Yes, and that's where things get even more interesting, potentially leaning towards lidocaine. A large observational study looked at over 14,000 in-hospital cardiac arrests. 14,000. That's a lot of data. It is. And this study associated lidocaine use with a higher chance of achieving return of spontaneous circulation. The adjusted odds ratio was about 1.15, meaning roughly a 15% higher odds compared to amiodarone. Okay, so better ROSC again, but this time in an observational setting. What else? That same study also linked lidocaine to better short-term survival. Higher odds of survival at 24 hours, adjusted odds ratio 1.16, about 16% higher. And longer term. Also higher odds of survival to discharge, adjusted odds ratio 1.11, roughly 19% higher. And importantly, it was also associated with a higher likelihood of a favorable neurologic outcome at discharge. Really? How much higher? The adjusted odds ratio for favorable neurologic outcome was 1.18, so about 18% higher odds with ligocaine compared to amiodarone in this large observational data set. 
So, the observational data seems to paint a more favorable picture for lidocaine across several outcomes, including neurologic outcome. But we always need to think about the quality of the evidence, right? What are the strengths and weaknesses here? Absolutely critical point. The strength of the randomized trial is, obviously, its design randomization is our best tool to reduce bias when comparing treatments directly. High level evidence. Right. And the strength of the large observational study is its size and its reflection of real world practice. It tells us what might be happening outside the strict confines of a trial. We also need to consider practical things like pharmacokinetics, how the drug works in the body, and just how easy it is to use. Okay, but what about the downsides, the limitations? You mentioned the randomized trial didn't find a survival difference. Correct. A key limitation of that main randomized trial was that it was likely underpowered. It just didn't have enough patience to reliably detect a potentially small but real difference in survival to discharge. So it might have missed a difference if one existed. It's possible. Also, in that trial, giving the antiarrhythmic drug was often delayed, which could, you know, muddy the waters regarding how effective the drugs truly were when given promptly. Okay, what else? Yeah, well, relying heavily on ROSC as an outcome, while practical, isn't ideal for long-term goals. We yeah. really care about that neurologically intact survival down the line. Makes sense. And the observational study. Observational studies, even large ones, have inherent limitations. They use registry data so you can find associations, but proving direct cause and effect is much harder than with a randomized trial. There could be other factors influencing the results. Got it. Any other limitations we need to keep in mind? Yes, a couple more. An older study from 2002, sometimes cited to support amiodarone, didn't really look at long-term survival or neurologic recovery, which are key today, and maybe most importantly for practice. Yeah. The amiodarone used in the big randomized trial was a specific formulation without polysorbate 80. But the amiodarone used in hospitals does contain polysorbate 80 as a dilerent. That difference could affect how the drug behaves, maybe its safety profile, limiting how well the trial results apply to everyday amiodarone use. That's a really crucial practical point of the formulation difference. Okay, so putting all this together, the trials, the observational data, the strengths, the limitations, what does this actually mean for clinicians at the bedside today? Guidelines like the American Heart Association's Advanced Cardiovascular Life Support still list both as first-line options, right? Does this evidence tip the scales? It's true. The guidelines allow for both. And let's be clear. The evidence still doesn't show that either drug consistently increases long-term neurologically intact survival as a primary finding. That ultimate goal remains elusive in the data comparing them head to head. So no magic bullet for long-term good outcomes yet. Unfortunately, not definitively shown for either drug over the other or placebo in that main trial. However, the emerging evidence we've discussed, particularly those secondary findings in the randomized trial showing better ROSC with lidocaine and the large observational study linking lidocaine to better ROSC, short-term survival, and neurologic outcome, well, it does suggest a potential edge for lidocaine. An edge based on getting the heart started and maybe better short-term results. Exactly. And then you factor in the practical aspects. Lidocaine generally has a faster onset, a shorter half-life, which can be easier to manage. It tends to have fewer significant drug interactions, and it comes in a convenient dosage form. Okay. Simpler profile, perhaps. Uh, How does the amiodarone compare, practically? Amiodarone uh, has a longer half-life, more potential for adverse effects, a greater number of drug interactions to worry about, and then there's that polysorbate 80 issue with the common formulation, which as we noted, wasn't what was used in the big trial. So considering everything, the lack of clear long-term survival benefit for other, but lidocaine's potential advantage in ROSC and short-term outcomes, plus its pharmacokinetic and safety profile, where does that leave us? It leaves us in a position where, while neurologically intact survival is the ultimate prize and isn't clearly won by either drug in the trials, the current balance of evidence seems to lean maybe cautiously towards lidocaine, it appears more effective for that immediate goal of restarting circulation, and it seems to have a more favorable overall profile regarding safety and administration. Okay, so if you had to rate the overall strength of the evidence for using these drugs, what would you say? I'd rate the overall evidence as moderate. Moderate. You can break that down a bit. Sure. The evidence that either drug definitively improves long-term neurologically intact survival compared to the other, or placebo, is frankly weak based on the primary trial results. Okay. 
But there is moderate evidence suggesting lidocaine might be superior for achieving return of spontaneous circulation and maybe for some short-term survival benefits, especially in the in-hospital setting based on that large observational study. And that's coupled with its generally better safety and administration profile. So moderate evidence overall, weak for the ultimate long-term goal, but moderate suggesting lidocaine has advantages in the immediate term and in practical use. That sums it up pretty well, yes. It sounds like while both lidocaine and amiodarone are still officially on the table, there are now pretty solid arguments, backed by recent evidence, favoring lidocaine, particularly for achieving that initial ROSC and considering its practical profile. Definitely food for thought for clinicians. I agree. And it highlights that despite these treatments, truly improving long-term neurologically intact survival after cardiac arrest is still a major hurdle. 